This is my research update on online training of small robust neural network on flight images. These slides were put together rather very quickly. So if there's anything you do not get or need clarification, just feel free to stop me at any time uh, throughout the presentation. So I'm going to first go over with talking about our scenario uh, for the vision-based navigation about a non-cooperative spacecraft, including the review of what kind of operational constraints there are and how that affects our design of the algorithm, the neural network, and so forth. Um, and then I'll talk about the overall strategy. So this includes a lot of like what was done in the past uh, publications as well, and some new results on that. So problem statement, uh, pretty much everybody knows at this point, monocular camera pose estimation of a non-corporative target from a singular sequence of images. Great for swap C requirements and sensor redundancy, but we are, well, for this, we're operating with the assumption that we do have a a priori knowledge of the target's 3D structure. So we do have the CAD model from the client for the purpose of servicing a known target um, in the space, for example. Um, and for this, well, in the past, we have relied mostly on the image processing algorithms. Nowadays, machine learning is kind of taking over that place because it is very fast to compute to do the per to perform the inference um, compared to and also the fact that it pretty much always gives you an answer um, instead of a lot of these image processing based algorithms, which have very low availability, availability of the the solutions for these very challenging uh, space images. So when we do this, what kind of operational constraints we have? Well, um, especially regarding the training and the operation of the machine learning models. And mainly that's two things. One is that space is a remote environment, which means we don't have uh, training data. And we also do not have the validation data. So unlike the autonomous driving, we cannot just go out and test our algorithm or our trained model to see how they perform on the road. That is just simply not possible. And the second is the lack of computation resources, though that has been going, getting slightly better and better um, as we move on. So given all these operational constraints, the, the overall strategy that we have conceived so far is the yeah. following. First, you start with the on-ground training of the synthetically generated images using the target's CAT model. Um, then we can train our neural network using a super powerful GPUs that would allow us to train these models in the matter of a couple hours. When these models are trained, then we can use the robotic test, test bed and the physical simulation of a mock-up model in representative space-like illumination conditions uh, to generate these images um, from Speed Plus uh, that have very vastly different visual characteristics compared to the training synthetic images, and also very representative of what the images will look like in space. So these allow us to get, um, you know, quantitatively and exhaustively um, characterize the robustness of our training model. Once this confirms us that our model is indeed robust across this, what is known as domain gap between image domains, then we can take this into on-orbit operation where we have a stream of incoming flight images of the same target. Um, and this neural network will run on spacecraft avionics. So this was the, and this will be done in the loop of a navigation filter, extend the camera filter or unset the camera filter. So this is what we have, what or what I have um, worked on and presented on in the past. So what is the remaining problem here in this full pipeline? So going from the synthetic images for training to validation using these robotic testbed images, there is a significant illumination gap in, for example, illumination that has been reduced with these physical stimulation and also slight re reduction of the gap in the target model, namely the 3D CAD model that is rendered versus the actual physical mock-up model. But there is still some gap between this uh, robotic test bed images and the flight images, namely in the gap between the mock-up model and the actual satellite 
model basically that has this, all this like metallic um, like surface properties, a lot of these reflected solar panels and so forth. And there may be some um, like noise, for example, any other visual characteristics that may have escaped our attention when generating these um, ground robotic images. So this, this could still be compensated with nonlinear filtering if um with a very careful tuning and design of you know tracking the st the state noise measurement noise and all that but is there something that we can do to further close this gap using the flight images that we get during rendezvous on the neural network side is the question of this presentation so naturally what we can do is first in the on ground we do what we've done before we train these neural networks to be as robust as possible using synthetic images and validating their robustness using the robotic testbed images. And when we take this into space, then we get these flight images that we can use to further train our neural network online using the incoming stream of flight images. And the idea is that we're going to use our Kalman filter, the navigation filter, and its state estimates and covariance to create a pseudo labels for these flight images that is incoming. Basically, the way it's done is in the camera filter update, the image will be will have image, the neural network will, pro will process that image and give us some measurements about its pose. Uh, in this case, it is a heat maps that are associated with the pre-designated key points of the spacecraft. So if you know where the key points, the if you detect these key points and you know what the 3D coordinates of these key points are in the CAT model, then basically you have established correspondence that you can solve through perspective and point algorithm to solve for the you know, position and orientation. So you will get these predictions that is going to be used in the common filter. So basically all these updates and outlier rejection and all that. And when we have the updated state and covariance for that correspond to this current time, this time step, that state estimate and covariance can be used uh, to basically generate, to recreate what the pseudo maps, uh, the pseudo label heat maps are corresponding to those relative state. This pseudo labels can be used with the predictions to basically compute the loss and then you do the gradient update on the neural network. So basically, you're doing this on a single image that you, you get at that time step, and then you do this update. So you're basically, you're continuing to train the neural network, but just using single images. So let's see. To talk a bit more about, so those two steps, the offline training part and then the online training part. So... In order for this to be successful, we need our offline training step to give us a neural network that is robust, um, so it can generalize across different types of images, but also small, because we do have the computational uh, constraint on the satellite avionics. And what we know in for these neural networks to be trained to be generalizable is that there are a couple of things. One is that transfer learning from pre-trained model is a key. Basically, you take a neural, you have a neural network that was pre-trained on very large data sets like ImageNet. Um, is going to give you better performance on these um, the the performance across domain gap compared to if you just randomly initialize the weights and then start the training from there. And the reason because when training neural network in its lost landscape, there are multiple, like countless number of minimal, a uh, global minima that you can reach in terms of the loss function. But those global minima are not equal in their generalizability. Some minima is going to generalize better than the other. And pre-training with very large data set like ImageNet 1K is going to put your neural network at a sweet spot in terms of the initialization such that you can reach that global minima that favors the generalizability. So that's why we need to use a pre-trained model of a neural network, which is a problem because if you have a new model that you want to train, then ImageNet training could be very expensive because ImageNet 1K, for example, has million images for thousand classes for classification. The other potential problem is that in general, when you look at literature, Bigger models will give you better performance. That's just the way it is. Um, for 
object detection, image net classification, all these different kinds of tasks, bigger models that have like tens of or hundreds of millions of parameters will give you better performance than uh, training the smaller models, uh, which kind of contradicts what the direction that we want to go for. So how do we train or you know end up with a small and robust neural network for our purposes? There are multiple solutions. One is you just got to be lucky. If you are a lucky person, someone might have trained the exact small neural network that you want with ImageNet. Then you can just use it and then fine tune it with your, for example, our speed data set. Second is if you're rich and you can afford the computation, just train it yourself. Because if you have multiple like eight GPUs, then you can probably train this thing in under 24 hours, especially if it's small. Uh, the third option is there's a way you can take a bigger version. Generally, if there's a network that you want, there's a family of network that you want to use, there will be a bigger version that has been pre-trained on ImageNet that you can train yourself on, you know, for speed, for example, and then reduce it down by, for example, pruning out the weights that are not necessary. So there are like a lot of ways that are just not being used, like weights are very close to zero, for example. There's a way you can prune them out. Or there's something technical knowledge distillation. That means you have a bigger network that gives you an output. If you train your smaller network to mimic the output of this bigger teacher model, then it turns out that that smaller student model can achieve comparable performance to its larger teacher model. So that is another thing um, that is possible. For now, I'm taking an easy road. And what I'm going to do is, because we're going, we need smaller model. We need a model that is on the order of like two or three million parameters. And since we're going to further train it online, I'm probably just going to pre-train it on the image net for enough time which could take under like 24 hours and then fine tune it on speed that will not give you as good as good of a performance it might be like a couple degrees of orientation off like worse and so forth but that will still be good enough to give us a good starting point for the online training so um yeah these are all just the things to consider when training the neural network for space run applications but i'm just taking the easy road for now uh so just exploring different kinds of neural networks. For post-estimation, there are really just um, two kind of categories of neural networks that one uses. One is on the left, that's what I use for SPMV2. Basically, you take this neural network backbone that was designed for classification, which means you take images of like a couple hundred pixels by a couple hundred pixels, and by the end of the neural network, you end up with a very small in general, like seven by seven uh, features. So, which is not going to be useful for us to recover the heat map. So what happens is you basically take the features at each step of the neural network, stage of the neural network with multiple, with different scales. And then you fuse them using a, another set of neural network that basically fuse the high resolution uh, features with low resolution features. And then at the end, out of this feature pyramid network or, or FPN, you take the feature of the highest resolution and then convert that into a heat maps. So that's what we use for SPMV2. Another is based on a more modern architecture called Vision Transformer. So basically the way Vision Transformer or VIT works is that it divide in the same way that Transformer works on the sentences or, uh, or words, basically it's going to divide the image into patches and then you basically have a sequence of patches that you put through all these transformation transformer blocks um i'm not going to go into the details and what happens at the end of this uh, vision transformer for these patches is that you're going to end up with a single scale that is still large enough so in this case it's going to be like uh 1 16th times 1 16th of the original image then we can do um append uh, two, for example, deconvolution layers that will bring our features to one-fourth by one-fourth, which is the heat map resolution that was used for the SPMV2. So that is so those two are the sort of architectures for the heat map prediction that we'll be exploring. 
of course, in order for the neural network to be robust across domain gap while only being trained on synthetic images, this thing needs to be trained on multiple different, um, basically there has to be a lot of data augmentation and try to confuse the neural network as much as possible so that it does not depend on the features that are specific to synthetic imagery. So what happens here is that I'm basically doing a lot of augmentation on the image level, and then I add like noise and all that in the end. But these are basically some different types of augmentation that can be done on images. So style augmentation basically takes the neural style transfer. So this is kind of a neural network where you give an image and then you give another image that is like a reference style image, and then you get a totally different new image of that style. So like you give an image of a tree, you get image of Van Gogh's painting. The result is the image of a tree in a Van Gogh's painting style. So basically using that neural style transfer to, uh, you know, change basically the style of our synthetic image um, in a random fashion. Deep, deep augment is also one of the, kind of image to image neural network pipeline um, that will that tries to basically for this one we're trying to inject noise into different levels of uh, features in that image to image neural network so that you know it randomizes that neural network forward uh, inference and then you end up with an uh, image that looks uh sort of randomized and it's like local features and the random comp is just we have a random convolution layer that you just pass the image through and that apparently it, you know, it distorts a lot of like local features of the of the of the image. So I basically I basically create these like four versions of images with synthetic images, and then you know when you train it, you add like extra like additional noise, like color jitter, and all that. So trying to do as much as possible on the image size. Now, uh. So on the top here is a neural network that has about 11.4 million parameters. This was the neural network backbone that was used for SPMP2. That's why I'm using it as a reference. And you can see that on when it's chained on synthetic images for 30 epochs, you get a pretty good like six degrees, seven degrees um, errors on the light box and sonnet images. Also reporting the performance on 25 flight images from the Prisma mission. Um, since there's only 25, it doesn't really bear any statistical significance, but you can still see that the performance, you know, is pretty satisfactory. So first looking at the backbones plus the feature pyramid network plus the head, um, there are a lot of different neural networks um, that are being tested here. But the idea is that if we want to use these for online training later on, they need to be fast in terms of the training and test time, and ideally also consume least amount of memory during the training. That includes the gradient um, that you're computing for the neural network, and then like updating all the memory that has been consumed there. Ideally, so all of these are actually kind of like irrelevant experiments because they have um, Basically, it has some normalization layers that depend on batch of images. But what we want is to work on single images that are incoming, for which this guy would be the ideal candidate. But because um, this thing is being image net pre-trained right now, so I don't really have a result for that. If you look at the other one that has that is based on the vision transformer, this is actually a lot quicker, probably by like the fact like half the uh, half the training and test time. And the, probably the reason is because it doesn't have the feature fusion um, part of a neural network that is also taking a lot of time because it's working on like very high resolution features. But you know, in terms of the light box, this is giving us like pretty good performance. Its performance on Sunlamp and Prisma might not be the best, but this kind of gives us an idea that you know this is a very attractive numbers in terms of working with um, spacecraft avionics. So if there's a way we can train this to be further robust to these two um, like additional, arguably more difficult image domain, then this might be an ideal candidate uh, to be used on the spacecraft avionics. So I'm going to so for the online training, I'm going to be using the guy at the bottom. Uh, and this is just done study on like depending on which sets of images we decide to use or not basically the idea is that if you use all three 
the performance is the is the best. All right, online training. So now that we have a trained neural network, I'm going to stick this thing into a camera filter from the previous publication that basically tracks the relative state of the target spacecraft with respect to the camera, uh, both position and orientation and uh, relative angular velocity. And then every 10 images, um, I'm going to do one step of gradient update on the neural networks. So one image online training, every 10 images using a fixed learning rate, which is a very small number here. Now, and in order to show how ODR performs for different level of baseline performance, basically from the previous training, where I've trained for 30 epochs, which means the network has seen the data set 30 times in its training, I'm basically going to use the models after 10 epochs, 20 epochs, and 30 epochs. So the model after 10 epochs of training arguably has worse performance. And at 30 epochs, it has best performance because it was trained for a longer time. So I'm going to take these three different models and then basically try to perform ODR on the shirt data set on these two different data sets that you see here. Uh, these are both live box images. So they are different from the synthetic images that were used for training. And what we see here, what we see here is the steady state error, uh, which is basically the error during the second half of the trajectory. Um, the the absolute error, sorry, absolute error of the UKF uh, UKF state that is being estimated. And what you see here is that for both ODR actually does bring down the errors uh, for some very considerably. So, for example, for RE one we see that the depth for the camera is, the error is getting brought down from about a meter to 80 centimeters. The angles, well, for the yaw angle, for some reason is being brought down from three degrees to average under one degree. And you can see the same trend for all of them. So the ODR is actually, there is an advantage of doing this. Now, this is the performance of the filter, but what about the neural network itself, if we isolate the neural network from the camel filter? How does ODR, this online training on these trajectory images actually change the generalizability or the performance of a neural network itself? So basically, for each of these models, I took the model after one orbit and then after the second orbit. And Basically, I took those models and then performed evaluation on both not only that shirt trajectory images, but also the speed plus lightbox images, which is the same image domain. So speed plus lightbox images will give you a more a better idea of how well this thing works in this image domain in general, because it has a lot more images of different viewpoints. It has something about like 6,700 images. And interesting thing to see here is that while the shirt on the shirt images, the, the errors are brought down significantly, especially in terms of the uh, rotation error. If you look at the RE1 trajectory, the performance on speed plus actually has not improved that much. And in fact, for some cases, it might be worse than when you where you started off. Whereas for the RE2, you see, you do see the improvement of the neural network on speed plus data set after ODR. Why? Most likely because if you look at these uh, trajectories, in RE1, you only see a very restricted view of the target. So the, the neural network is only tr being trained on a same set of images over and over again. Whereas with the RE2, you get to see this guy from all different kinds of views. So the neural network is being trained on much more diverse sets of images compared to RE1, which probably, which that well, most likely explains why we do see the improvement on the performance on the speed plus data set that consists of data uh, images from all different kinds of angles and the variation distance and so forth. So what this tells us is that, well, we better be doing this when we get to see the, the target from a different point, different viewpoint. Um, and if that's not possible, then we might want to bring our um, target to a relative orbit that allows us to do this. Uh, let's see. One, so one thing to note here is that we've only 
tested this for up to two orbits. So we really don't know what's going to happen like if this goes on for like more than two orbits, especially for our RE one case, because it is, it is possible that it is possible that neural network is trained only on this certain sets of images too long, such that it forgets how to perform post estimation on different kinds of viewpoints. It is definitely a possibility. Um, at least this is telling us that, well, that's not going to happen, but that is something that we need to check later on um, somehow uh, for a much longer time period. Computational breakdown, that's the last thing to discuss. Um, so I'm testing this all using the C++ implementation of PyTorch uh, with full precision floating, single precision floating point weights. So there's no overhead from the Python and all that. Uh, on the desktop, four propagation on GPU, so that includes four propagation and also the computation of the gradient. It takes seven milliseconds on that neural network. Um, processing the heat map measurement, so that that means you get the heat map and then you're extracting the peak and also characterizing the covariance of that heat map from its the, from its spread. Um, that is actually taking the longest time, even with the parallelization using OpenMP. So this is something where the optimization can, further optimization can be done in terms of computation. Filter iteration is very quick, 2.5 milliseconds. This includes the adaptive state noise computation, composition of the state noise. Uh, backward propagation, quicker than before propagation because we have already comp computed the, uh, the gradients. So... I will have to further test this on our NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which is a very, you know, almost like Raspberry Pi with some older generation of GPU to see how this thing performs on the Edge device. And finally, some visualization of the, of the results that you've seen. Model after 10 epochs of training, we're reporting the three sigma bound and the state estimate of the Cartesian and the angular um, relative state. And you see that is, red. Is the ODR? So ODR is being done in this okay, in, in this simulation. It's during ODR. It's during ODR. Yeah. yeah. So initially, you will see that the red and blue are pretty much the same. But as we continue performing ODR, uh, ODR which is what we the online domain ref, uh, refinement, uh, just a, some term that we just use for all, online training here, you will see that the red, which is the ODR, is performing better overall as the time goes. And the same thing for an even better model, um, especially, yeah, especially the depth. So, so the camera bore site, the depth uh, estimate is definitely getting better uh, with some smoothed out the rotation estimate and all that. So moving forward, with respect to the online training, there's still a lot of questions that needs to be answered. So when to perform online training? Right now, we are just doing from the get-go Every 10 images, we're just performing this. But when do we begin performing online training? That is a crucial um, answer. One possibility is let's look at the state's estimates, uh, three sigma covariance. But I mean, looking at here, three sigma bound is pretty big here, especially for orientation. But I mean, ODR can still give us a fairly reliable pseudo labels. So that might not be a, or that might be too conservative of a criterion. So something, so we need to consider something there. How often to perform online training? So right now, I've, I'm doing it every 10 images. Given the angular velocity of the target, um, that gives you about approximately 10 degrees of viewpoint change from one OD, uh, online training step to the next. Uh, so that could be the um, criterion here. You need to have like enough angular separation between each step of online training. But I mean, if we look at the RE1 case here, that is, we need additional criterion to make sure that we're not just seeing the same thing over and over again. So maybe there is, I don't know, some quantitative way, of, some way of quantifying this, the evenness in terms of the orientation um, of the samples that you have seen previously that you can use to say, okay, we're seeing too much of the same thing. We should stop this for a moment or well, we're seeing the diverse set of samples, so we should continue doing this. This could be another set of um, criterion there. And finally, how to design um, learning schedule. This really depends on how many iterations of online training we want to do, because in the end, we want our learning rate to decay down to near zero, so that you know, with a smaller learning rate, you get that 
fine tuning at the end to get a slightly better results at the end. So this really depends on another way of posing this question is when do we end this thing? So it's all questions to be remained and we would also have to think about how to properly test them over a long period of time to uh, really quantify these. So yeah. <laughs>